welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord today? Listen, you don't come to hear from a man. You don't come to hear from the old or the young, the white, the brown, the black, any other color like that. You come to hear from God. Don't make it a point to hear from men. Why? Because men have nothing to say. All right? We come into this place to hear from God. And I'm going to get down on my knees, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us today. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to be our leader and our guider. And, and, and if you could get on your feet and stand as we go before the Lord in prayer, I would appreciate that. If you can't, it's okay. But Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we are just grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here in the house of the Lord. Father, we don't take that for granted. We don't come to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come for tradition or ceremonial ritual. God, we don't come to church for entertainment. But Lord, we come to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher today. Lord, that you would speak to us, show us things, be our counselor and our guidance today, Father, as we get into the Word of God. Lord, I pray that it would be a seed that is planted into our hearts, into our lives of good ground, that we would bear much fruit in our lives. God, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, we thank you for all the things that you've done for this church and all the things that you're going to continue to do. And we don't ask this, these blessings just upon ourselves, but Lord, upon all the churches across the world and the Inland Empire that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we're, we are all many members of one body, that is the body of Christ, working together for your kingdom. Father, we ask that you bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Lutheran, and Methodist brothers and sisters, our Foursquare, and, and, and Charismatic brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for the Calvary chapels around the area. Father, we thank you for our local churches, for Harvest, for the Grove, for Sandals, the Well, the Way, for Ecclesia for Emmanuel Baptist, for uh, Trinity. Father, we thank you for uh, Oak Valley, Crossroads. Lord, all the churches around the Inland Empire and around the world, we thank you that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. And Lord, to you be the praise, to you be the honor, and to you be the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're taking your seats, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the eighth chapter, if you're just joining us. We've been going through the book of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept, for quite some time. Now, what that means is the Bible was written that way. Thought upon thought, word upon word. We study it that way, partially because it was written that way. Yes, we want to know it. But also because it forces us, it, it, it encourages us to get the contextual meaning of the word of God. So that we can't just pick and choose and pull things out and, and twist and turn them into however we want. We want to have a solid, rooted, and founded uh, uh, foundation in the Word of God. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been in Hebrews, the 8th chapter. Pastor Jim brought us last week into Hebrews, the 8th chapter. Amazing message about living better in 2014. If you didn't hear it, go ahead, go online and watch it. Tell you, tell you what, some amazing, some amazing truths into there, some of the better things we have, better ownership, better covenant, better promises. I'll tell you what, what an encouragement it was. And today we look at Hebrews in the 8th chapter again. I'm going to read and then I'll give you the title of the message. I'm going to read from verse number 1 through verse number 5 today so we can see what we're talking about. Now this is the main point of the things that we are saying. We have such a high priest, speaking of Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not men. We're going to talk about man's tabernacle in just a moment. But we're talking about Jesus Christ. We talked about this last week uh, of some of the things that we have, our great high priest. For every high priest, verse number three, is anointed or appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. We could write volumes literally beyond the capacity of this world of what Jesus Christ has to offer. Uh, first and foremost, as we discussed last week, life and more abundant life. Praise God. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. This is verse number five, where we're going to focus in on today. Who serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things. You see, God, as we learned through the book of Hebrews, and we saw that, that there was some fault in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, and, and it wasn't because God created that and realized afterwards, oh, you know, I, 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 there, I left some things uncovered. No, God began a work with the Old Covenant and the Old Testament to, to lead us to the place of Jesus Christ, to bring us to the realization that we need 
need Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle used the word uh, a tutor. The law or the old covenant served as a tutor or a guardian showing us our need for Jesus Christ. So the things of the old covenant, the things of the Old Testament, the priests and so forth and so on, they served as shadows or types of what Jesus Christ would come to fulfill. You think of a shadow. When you see a shadow, you're not seeing the actual substance. You're seeing the shadow of it or the, the, the whole of that it cuts out in the beam of light. The shadow of the priest, the offerings, the sacrifices, the laws, and so forth and so on. These were shadows of Jesus Christ coming to fulfill them. So the priests, they had to offer things according to the rules, according to what was instructed to them. Moses built a tabernacle according to the directions given to him. But it wasn't the true tabernacle. This was the temporary one where God's true tabernacle, the heavenlies, is where God dwells. So here we see in verse number 5, who served the copy and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed. Today I want to really key in, I want to really focus in on that phrase. Moses was divinely instructed. God gave Moses specific plans, and we'll see these in just a moment. Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he, speaking of God, said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. God gave Moses a pattern. God gave Moses a template. He gave him divine instruction. The title for this morning's message is, Fulfilling the Will of God for Your Life. Fulfilling the will of God for your life. You see, God gave Moses specific direction. As Moses was up on the mountain in Sinai in the presence of God, God laid out for Moses the plan of the law. He laid out for Moses the plan of the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God. God laid out for Moses the commandments, the rituals. He laid out for Moses the definitive plan. God knew exactly what he wanted and he gave Moses direction. He gave Moses direction to the point where he gave him exact measurements. He gave him the, 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 the materials in which cloths were to be made of. He gave him what, should, what the Ark of the Covenant would look like. He told him how it should be built. He even told Moses who would build it. God gave Moses definitive and direct plans. God has definitive and direct plans for each and every one of us. You've got to realize that. You've got to understand that. You weren't born to just exist. Even if, even if you were the result of two drunken people coming together and nine months later, there you are on the scene. God brought you here on this earth right now at this time for a purpose. And God has a purpose and a plan for you to live and fulfill. And it is your and my responsibility to make it a point to understand, to get into the word of God so that we can uh, uh, to get this in our mind so that we can live according to God's will and purpose for our lives. It is not God's desire desire for you to live and exist, retire, do whatever you want to do and die and somebody take your place and live and exist. No, God wants you to live a fulfilled life here on earth with a legacy that you have left behind for the glory of God. That is his plan for each and every person. You may feel like you have no call. You may feel like you have no purpose, but God has a purpose for each and every one of us. Just as Moses was divinely instructed, I want to say something and I want you to get this. Just as Moses was divinely instructed, to those who are listening, God directs. To those who are listening, God directs. Look throughout the entire course of the Bible, from the beginning all the way through the end. God directs Adam and Eve. God directed them. Adam, this is your job. Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree. Oh, you ate from that tree? This is what's going to happen now. Noah, you're going to do this. Moses, I need you to do this. David, you're going to do this. Solomon, do this. Elijah, here's your plan. Elisha, go and say this. All throughout the Old Testament, Jesus was led by the gospel, by the, the presence of God. The Apostle Paul, Peter, James, John, Philip, Stephen, Andrew, all of the apostles and the disciples were led and directed and instructed by God because they put themselves in the position to hear and act and fulfill what God has. God wants to speak to you. God wants to direct you. God has a plan and he wants you to fulfill it so that you lived a fulfilled and blessed and anointed life here on earth. But you and I have got to position ourselves so that we can hear and operate in God's 
plan. We have to be prepared. So today we're going to talk about fulfilling God's will. Three things today. Three things we're going to talk about today. Fulfilling God's will. Number one, in fulfilling God's will, it takes consecration. It takes consecration. Consecration is cleansing. It's removing ourselves from the old, from the the things that would tarnish or or, or would try to stain or wrinkle uh, our appearance and make ourselves clean before God. You see, God desires for you and I to live a consecrated life, to live a holy, a righteous, a just life in right standing with Him. We're talking about God giving Moses direction. As Moses was in the presence of God in that burning bush, God spoke to him and said, remove your shoes for you are standing on holy ground. You see, Moses had sandals on. They stood as a buffer between him and the presence of God and God wants us to be directly connected, directly united into his glory, into his presence, into his righteousness and in order to do so, church we have got to be consecrated. We have got to be clean before God. We have got to wash ourselves of the things of what we once do. Why would God, listen, why would God speak to us? Why would God direct us when we are doing things that are in opposition to him? You know, I've got a little boy. He's two years old. I shared this on Christmas Eve. My little boy, he sat on Santa Claus's lap. Santa Claus asked him, hey, what do you want for Christmas? Bjorn looked at Santa and he said, I want Reese's. (laughs) He has a thing for Reese's. Sure enough, Christmas came, he got some Reese's. Now, if I was to see my little boy right before dinner, which on many occasions I have, to see him right before dinner, find that secret stash of Reese's that he hides from us, and he's just sitting there in the corner, just chowing down on a Reese's, as a dad, knowing what's best for him, would I look at him and say, hey, you know what, since, since you've already eaten before dinner, since you've already spoiled your dinner, you know what, why don't you just forego the, the, the nutrients and everything that you need. How about just, how, here's another package of Reese's. Keep eating them. Have fun. Enjoy it. He would wish that I would do that, but as a dad, you and I know that I won't do that. Why? Because I don't want him to only eat Reese's. There's nothing that would good, that good that would come out of that. Same concept. That you and I do the things that we want to do, how we want to do them, when we want to do them, how, you know, where we want to do them. And then God says, I want you to live according to what I'm asking you to do. And when you do, I will bless you beyond your wildest dreams. But you've got to make the effort. You've got to do something about it. And God is desiring for his church to be clean before him, to be righteous and in right standing so that he can have a clear line of communication to us so that we're not distracted by the the issues and the vices that we are born into or that we live with, but rather we are freed from them by the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us white as snow. In Exodus in the 19th chapter, We're talking about Moses receiving divine instruction. In Exodus, the 19th chapter, God gives Moses some very specific thoughts here. Exodus, the 19th chapter, verse number 10. God is about to descend on the, 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 uh, the Mount Sinai in the presence of God. And he says to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. You shall set bounds. God is telling Moses, set a border around the mountains. The people saying, take heed. Don't go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever that touches the mountain will surely be put to death. Listen to what God says. He says, not a hand will touch him. Don't touch somebody that's gone on the mountain after I said don't. He says, but they shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether it be man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come to the mountain. God is saying, my presence is descending on this mountain. And God is the very source of all light in the universe. You see, where light exists, darkness cannot. It's it's, it's impossible. Where light exists, darkness cannot. You can go in the darkest, deepest cave in the world. You turn on a flashlight, anywhere that light exists, darkness is gone. And when, where light exists, darkness cannot. So God is telling the children of Israel, I am the source of light. I am righteousness. And I am coming down on this mountain. And you have got to wash the darkness, the old ways, to consecrate yourself, to remove yourself from who you once were. Because where I exist, the old ways, and you cannot. And so there was a fear. There was a reverence. And this was the presence of God on a mountain. Imagine now that Jesus Christ has come and now the presence of God through the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. How much more should we make the effort to consecrate ourselves to God? 
to live in right standing and just well, work with God so that God can look upon us and see and be pleased. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, gives us the great analogy of the church. Girls, sometimes you don't like to be called sons of the Most High or sons of God, but guess what? Ephesians, the fifth chapter, gives us, uh, us guys and the church the analogy that we are the bride of Christ. So the girls are the sons of God, but the men are also the bride of Christ. We are all one in God. And the Bible tells us that the bride of Christ, that Christ washed and, and wanted to present her without spot or wrinkle or blemish. God paints the picture of a bride standing at the altar in that white dress, all done up, all perfect. I remember my beautiful wife. I mean, she had her hair done. Her makeup was perfect. She had that dress. I'll never forget what she looked like. And that's God's desire for you and I, that we would look like that, that we would be white, washed white as snow by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible gives us so many liberties in the word of God, but it gives us definitive things that you and I have got to abstain and walk away from and stop doing. But thank God the Bible tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. But it takes our desire to do so. We have got to consecrate our lives. We're talking about fulfilling the will of God. Number two today, fulfilling the will of God takes dedication. It's going to take dedication. A dedication to the word of God. A dedication to the things of God. A dedication to following after God. Not to just give up after a few days or weeks of silence or, or lack of hearing, but rather but to stay in it. You see, our human nature, we're like water. We, we follow the path of least resistance. We go for the easiest, the quickest, and I'll add for my own life, the cheapest decisions we can make. And oftentimes we seek after God and we ask God, what is it that you want? And God will have us to wait. The Bible says to be still and know that I am God. Sometimes God's desire for us is to wait for his answer. But that's against our human nature. It's going to take dedication for us to say, God, I'm asking you. I'm believing for the answer and I won't act until I get it from you. And let me tell you something. Going against our human nature, oftentimes the answer of God is not always the quickest, the easiest. Oh, praise God, it's not always the cheapest decision. But it takes a dedication to do it, to follow it, to hear the voice of God, to get into the word of God, to study it. The psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I would not sin against you. Why not? I have not hidden my, your word in my heart that I, that I might have to, you know, wonder what does the Bible say after I did this? No, 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 no. The psalmist says, I did it so I wouldn't sin against you. It means when I'm faced with something because of my dedication to the word of God, I know what not to do. And God is asking for a dedicated people. Looking at an example, I think a great example of, of, of human nature just in general. In Exodus in the 32nd chapter, Moses is up on the mountain with God on Mount Sinai in the presence of God, being sustained by the very glory and presence of God. He's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Exodus in the 32nd chapter, looking at dedication, or in this case, the lack thereof. Exodus in the 32nd chapter, verse number 1, says, Now when the people saw that Moses was delayed coming down from the mountain, Moses was delayed, which means they didn't know when he was coming back. I was on an airplane on Friday. It was delayed. I didn't know when it was going to take off. But eventually it did. Moses was delayed. The people gathered to Aaron. Of all people, Aaron, who what they say should know better. And they said, come, let us make gods that, we, that shall go before us. For as of this Moses, this, this man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, that one guy, remember, he stood there in the sea parted. That guy, we don't know where he went. He's gone. We don't know what happened to him. And Aaron, of all people, of all people talking about dedication, Aaron says, okay, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters. Bring them to me. So all the people broke off golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Keep in mind, keep in mind, Moses is on the mountain in the shroud in the glory of God, visible. God fell upon them. There is God there. Moses is up there. They're making a calf on the ground, having a party, saying, this is our new God. Dedication. God is with Moses, and he says, Moses, you better get down there, because I'm about to invoke my wrath upon these people. And Moses says, we're a stiff-necked people. Forgive us. Moses goes down, sees all this stuff, grinds up that golden calf, puts it in their water, and makes them drink it. Dedication. We seek the easiest. We seek the fastest. But sometimes God says, listen, I want you to wait. 
I want you to hear from me. It might be a while the next time you hear from God. You might hear from God and He might give you definitive direction. And it might be some time until you hear from God again. That doesn't mean that you deviate. That doesn't mean that you wander. That doesn't mean that you've given up. That doesn't mean that God has left you. What that means is that God wants you to do and be dedicated to what He directed you to do. And I find in my own life that when God speaks to me or gives me instruction, when I do it and complete it, I hear from God again. So God's asking for a dedication from His church, a, a willingness to get into the Word of God, to seek the Word of God, to study it, to not waste our time on things. You know, seeking God will never, ever, ever in your life be wasted time. You will never waste a moment of your life seeking God. You'll waste hours, days, months, hey, years watching television or eating fast food or, or doing whatever it is that you like to do, but you will never waste a single moment seeking after God because God's desire is dedication from His people. He wants us to be dedicated to Him. And in dedication, we find our third and final point for this, this morning in, in, in fulfilling God's will. Number three for today is prayer and fasting is in prayer and fasting. You see, prayer is essential. Prayer is essential. Any relationship without communication will not succeed. If you're married and you look at your husband and your wife and you don't say another word for as long as you live, it won't be long until that relationship is done. If you're a friend, a business, a partner, whatever it might be, communication is always essential. And it's the same with God. It's mandatory. God is desiring, God is asking, God is telling us, God is mandating that you and I remain in a constant state of communication with God. Paul the Apostle tells the church to pray always without ceasing. It's like when you're on the phone. You talk on the phone. As soon as you hang up, the line's cut. The conversation's over. God is asking you and I to not hang up the phone. Oftentimes we go through our life and we pray, oh, our Father who art in heaven, blah, blah, blah. You know, go on, go on, go on. I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, this. Okay, these are my issues. All right, click. Turn the radio or the TV up. God's desiring prayer, communication, a dedication to Him. He wants us to know Him and get to know Him through prayer. There was a young man a while back. He was asking for some advice in our young adults group, and I came up to him. He came up to me after service a while back, and he says, "You know, what do I do?" I told him, "I tell everybody the same thing." He says, "What do I do?" He says, "You need to pray about it." So oh, that's what everybody's telling me to do. Duh. Because it's not me that gives you the answer. It's not your friends that give you the answer. It's not your mom or your dad that give you the answer. Your answer should come from God, but you're not going to get the answer from God unless you pray and ask God for it. You get what I'm saying? Prayer is mandated. We know much about prayer. We've heard about prayer. We know that. Let's talk about this other subject, fasting. What is that? Well, in the Old Testament, fasts were called in times of mourning, in need of direction, or in times of distress. Moses was the first example in the Bible of fasting as he was in the presence of God and God sustained him. The very first commandment to man from God, or the, the, the very first rule, was, was dietary restriction. God told Adam, eat anything but that. So fasting is, is, is the willful sacrifice of something in your life in these times because they didn't have television or social media or internet or any, whatever it might be. It was food. That's what the family re re revolved around. So fasting was giving up of the food or, or, or withdrawing from something that you love. In Exodus 24 chapter, Exodus 34 chapter, Moses was in the presence of God. Forty days and forty nights sustained by God. Throughout the Old Testament, fasting occurred. David fasted. Elijah fast, the prophets fasted, the kings who were loyal to God fasted, Jehoshaphat as he was faced with armies called a fast across the nation to, to seek the wisdom of God and God gave him the answer, the battle plan to put the praise, the, the worshipers before the army. Fasts were called. In Ezra, the eighth chapter, Ezra, the eighth chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead. Ezra is a prophet in the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was in the captivity of Israel. Nehemiah had petitioned the king to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls after it had been sacked and destroyed. And he had the king's blessing. Now Ezra is taking the people uh, of Israel back to their home and he is, is going to do so. And Ezra does not ask the king of Persia for assistance, for an armed escort. But he realizes on the journey that there are people that oppose him. So Ezra finds himself and the people in grave danger. Danger, danger. And in Ezra, the eighth chapter, look what he says. This is the essence of it. He says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek Him for the right way for us, and for our little ones, and for all our possessions. 
that we might humble ourselves. You see, a fast is willingly foregoing or willingly abstaining for something that you like, food, entertainment, whatever it might be, and dedicating that time to seeking God. You see, a fast is not like those who you, of you who are familiar with Lent. Lent, you know, the, the, the Catholics and some of the denom denominations practice Lent where they would give up 40 days before Easter and they would give up something in hopes that that would be a purification process, that God would see that sacrifice and bless them. A fast is not about that. A fast is seeking after God and hearing instruction, wisdom, and, 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 and direction for your lives. A fast is not to be from man to man or so, so that you can go and say, well, look at this person. Look how holy they are. Look how righteous they are because they've abstained or they're not eating and, and they look hungry or they're tired or they're grouchy. A fast is strictly between you and God so that you would humble yourself before God to receive direction, wisdom, and instruction. And Ezra, going on in verse number 23, it goes on to say, Ezra says, we prayed and fasted and he answered our prayer. He answered our prayer. So fasting is all throughout the Old Testament. The only commandment to fast in the Old Testament was on the Day of Atonement. That was the commandment. But you and I are freed from the law, so there is no commandment for us to fast. But fasting is assumed. Listen, fasting is assumed in the New Testament. Let me show you. Jesus, on the great Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew, the sixth chapter, says to you and I, to everybody who's listening and reading thousands of years later, and when you fast. Not if you fast, or if you think about fasting, or if you should cho so choose to decide to fast. He says, and when you fast. So he is saying that there is an assumption that you love God enough that every once in a while in your life that you would give up something that you like, whether it be food or entertainment or television or whatever it might be between you and God, that you take the time that you would be eating or you would be watching TV or spending on the internet or on social media or whatever it might be, and you take that time like Ezra and humble yourself before God and seek for God's direction and listen and hear the word of God. Jesus says, when you fast, don't be like the hymn hypocrites with a sad countenance for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Jesus is telling you it's not about recognition. It's not about outward appearance. The Pharisees, they would suck in their cheeks as they walked down the streets and they would, you know, pull in and they would kind of, you know, look weak. And people would say, man, look at you. You're, you're a really righteous and religious man. You're doing that. Jesus says they'll have their reward. But he goes on to say, verse number 17, but when, but you, you, me, when you fast, not if you fast, should you fast, or should you decide to think about it, but when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, goes on to say, that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. A fast is a sacrifice, something that you go through, that you go, uh, you, you take the time if it's food, maybe, maybe you're, you're abstaining from food. Well, you know, that lunch hour when you're not eating, and you're really hungry and your stomach's grumbling, that's the time to dedicate to God, to say, God, I'm giving this up for you. I'm seeking after you, and I want some answers. I need some answers. I need some direction. Lord, this is my dedication to you. And when you do expect, listen, expect to grow. Expect to learn. Expect to hear and receive from God because the Bible says that God who sees you in secret will reward you openly. So God is asking for us, the church, to fulfill his will, to understand his plans for our lives, that we've got to set ourselves aside, no longer be a part of this world, but be a part of God. We have got to be dedicated to, do, to follow the word of God, the will of God, to listen to what God says, to get into his word and study it so that we might not sin against him. God is desiring communication through prayer. He wants a relationship with you and I, and he wants dedication to, for you to say, I want you to love me enough to give up something that you love to seek me, to show that you are seeking me first. The kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. God is after the desires of your heart. And in doing so, you will hear from God. <laughs> Prayer can always be done without fasting. You can always pray without fasting. You do not have to fast to pray. But listen. You cannot fast without prayer. 
Prayer can always be done without fasting. But you cannot fast without prayer because it becomes religious, it becomes uh, uh, sacrimonial, and if God's not after that, God's not after your, 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 your penance, God's after your heart. And when you fast and you dedicate to God the time or the hunger or whatever it is, the awareness, the thought of, oh my Lord, what I love, a double-double right now with some extra spread and some animal-style fries. Well, that's an indication right now that I need to pray because that's what God is desiring for us. And when you do, listen, no moment of your life spent seeking after God will ever be counted as waste. Not one single moment of your life will be ever counted as waste. And in 2014, imagine what the body of Christ globally, not just the Rock Church or World Outreach Center, but imagine what the body of Christ globally would look like if we wouldn't waste as much time on television or entertainment or hobbies or whatever it might be and spend some time dedicating ourselves to getting to know our God and seeing what God's plan is for our life. Could you imagine what we as a church would fulfill if we lived and operated fully in God's plan and will? That's God's desire for us. There's no reason that we can't. There's nothing holding us back except us. And we've got to realize that God's after our consecration. God's after our dedication. God wants prayer and communication. And he desires sacrifice and fasting from us so that we would hear from him. The church, the pastors here at the church have, have decided in the month of January, we're going we're gonna to fast for this. We're going to believe in God. For this place, for this establishment, for this body. We're going to believe for, for great and mighty things in this year. And we've all decided now, everybody's doing something different. I'm not, I'm not saying that one person's doing this. Some people are giving up dinners at 7 o'clock, or some people are doing a meal a day, or some people are doing TV, or, or, or whatever it might be, uh, social media. Or they're only eating a certain type of food. But we've decided, we've, we've, we've dedicated in our hearts that we're going to believe in this church. We're going to believe God for direction. We're going to believe God for signs, wonders, and miracles. We're going to believe God for souls and salvations. We're going to believe God for new ministries to be birthed out of this place, for more people to be reached. And so we ourselves have joined together on a fast. And I want to challenge you to join with us in the month of January, to go before God and pray and ask God, what is it that I might give up? What is it that I might do? Maybe it's a day, a one-day thing, or maybe it's a week. Maybe you give up something for the whole month of January. That's you between you and God. It's not to be broadcast. It's not to be uh, out there so that men can see. It's between you and God. But I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Join with us today in the church and the, the leadership of this church and, and your fellow brothers and sisters in this congregation as we go before the Lord in the month of January and we seek after God earnestly with all of our heart. Praise God, the Bible says that when you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. Praise God, the Bible says that when you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And I tell you what, I want more of God in 2014 than I had in 2013. And I want more of God in 2015 and 2014 and on and on and on and on. So if you do, I want to encourage you. I want to give you some thoughts to pray about because you can never fast without prayer. Pray for your family. Pray for yourselves. You need direction in your life. Pray for your children, your spouse, your loved ones, unsaved family members. Believe in God for answers or for laborers to be sent about their path. For your job, for your finances. God's hand needs to be on that in your life as you decide or if you decide to do this. Pray about these things. When it comes to the church, pray for the church. Pray for what is your involvement here. Would God have you to put your hand to work doing something here, getting involved in the children's or the youth or the outreach? You, you know, yesterday on Saturday, we had about 35 people in green, lime green shirts that say Operation Reach Out. They go out and they witness to the people of San Bernardino. Could you imagine what that would be like if we had 100 or 150? We wouldn't just have to say San Bernardino. We would affect San Bernardino, Highland, Colton, Riverside, Loma Linda, Ucaipa, Beaumont, Bend. Cala Mesa, Fontana, Rialto, because we get involved. So pray what God would have you to do this year. Let's do something together. Pray for freedom for our future and the finances of this church. Hey, listen, we are tired every month of being behind on bills. We are tired of being inhibited by, by finances to not do what God has called us to do. We want to sow more into missions. We want to sow more into schools. We want to sow more into ministries around the Inland Empire. We want to pick people up. We want to witness to them. We want to make souls and desire, win souls and make disciples. And we need God's hand on that. We want you to believe with us for that. Believe for God for signs, wonders, and miracles. That people would walk on the very campus of this, of this church and they would be healed of disease or infliction. That they would walk and they would come with a heavy heart and leave 
with the peace of God that surpasses all understanding that would guard their hearts and minds, that they would understand that we want more signs, wonders, and miracles in the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. It's our responsibility to seek after God. He'll show us when we do. Pray for the pastors and leaders, Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah, as they lead us on this great journey of our walk in our Christian faith. Pray for the executive leaders and the pastoral leadership, the children and the youth and the outreach and all the different departments. We covet and need your prayers. So if you join with us, and I challenge you, I, I commend you to think about it, pray about it, pray for us, pray for you, and let's see what God does in 2014. Did you guys get something out of the Word today? Listen, let me do one more thing today. I want to ask you a very important question. Let me just, just ask you for a moment of your attention. Just please don't get up, don't walk around. The reason is it's really important what I'm about to say, and I don't want you to be a distraction or, or to be distracted yourself. So let me just ask you this question. Answer it within your heart. If you were to leave today and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, but you were just to die, boom, there it is. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Simple question. Why don't you answer that within your own heart? You know, the Bible says that we ought to examine ourselves from time to time. So what makes you think you're going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you hope, because you want, because you think, because you wish you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to get there? Nowhere does it say that you can hope, think, or want. Like the person who has the most positive outlook on life or, or the happiest person who goes about life or the most bubbly person gets into heaven. I'm sorry. You can't get to heaven because of your positive outlook on life or because of your hopes or your dreams or your desires. You might say, well, you know, I think I'm going to get to heaven because my parents told me I was a Christian. I was baptized or christened as a baby. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school classes. Uh, you know, I, 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 all my life I was in church. I'm here today. People in church go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you you're a Christian because you got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck? That means you're going to get to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were baptized as a baby you're going to get into heaven? You can't find that in the Word of God. Did you know that nowhere does it say in the Word of God that because your parents told you you were a Christian because you're in church today that you're going to get into heaven? You know, God is more not so interested in the GPS location of your rear end on a Sunday morning as He is your heart. You might say, well, because I sat in church, that means I paid my penance. I'm sorry. It's not about that. God's after more than that. You know, we oftentimes are here, oh, well, you know, I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I give to charitable organizations. I do more good in my life than bad. Good people go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people go to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are filthy rags. You see, nothing we could do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because God's standard is perfection. And the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of that. We can't do it on our own. The only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one, listen, no one goes to the Father except through him. He's the only way. And Jesus Christ, in the book of John, in the third chapter, speaking to a religious leader, a man by the name of Nicodemus, is talking to the subject of eternal life, and it says, in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. We've heard that term, the movies culture, uh, sitcoms. They, they made a mockery out of that. You think of weirdo, crazy, out of control, Christianity. Let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood's made it out to be our society. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again in the eyes of God and the heart of God has always meant the same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart, heart. It means that you've given God all of your life. He's after all or nothing. It's not about, listen, it's not about your mental ascent of who God is or your carnal knowledge about Jesus Christ. You can't pretty much go anywhere in America. Everybody knows about Jesus Christ at this point. It's not about your mental ascent of who God is or Jesus Christ. It's about all of your heart. It's about all of your life. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, know who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. Why? Because it's more than just your knowledge. God's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with him. Let me prove that to you in the Bible. The book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to the church. He says, when I come back, he says he better find you hot or he better find you cold. Because if he finds you lukewarm, he will vomit you from his mouth. Whoa, shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians and will be rejected and ejected out of the kingdom of God. You think of it like this. A hot day, grabbing a warm, or a, a warm soda, it just doesn't do the job. You just want to spit it out. Jesus says, I want you to be hot, or I'd rather you be hot, or I'd rather you be cold. Because if you're lukewarm, you're in the kingdom of God. What is lukewarm? Lukewarm is just a casual relationship. A little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. Kind of doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing, kind of bouncing around. You know, if you were in any other relationship on earth, whether it be romantic or business or anything like that, if you were in a casual back and forth, doing your own thing, doing some of their thing, not really giving it all of it, 
You know that that relationship wouldn't succeed, yet why do we think that we can be that way with God and that He would honor us? God is after all of our hearts. He's after all of our lives. Can't get to heaven your way? Hey, we can't get to heaven my way, some well-meaning church committee's way or author's way. The only way you and I can make it to heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ is that way. And Jesus says this. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But he says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Is what Jesus says. Today, the decision is yours. In a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it God's way. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that. In just a moment, here's what I want to ask you and challenge you to think about. In just a moment, when I smack my hand on my Bible, bang, just like that. I want you to be bold. I want you to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all my heart. I want to give him all my life. Pastor Luke, I want to make sure today that I get into heaven, that I don't go to hell. I want to make sure today where I go for eternity. You say, Pastor Luke, well, I don't know if I can raise my hand. I'm going to be embarrassed. Let me encourage you for a moment. Can I, just, can I just give you a little bit of encouragement? Stop that. Don't think about embarrassment. You know, you wouldn't be embarrassed if you bought a luxury car. Or if you got some money and you bought a nice big fancy house, this would be the best decision of your life. You should not be embarrassed about the very best decision you'll ever make. It's not about embarrassment. We're here to support you and love you. God is cheering you on. It is your free will choice. Who should raise their hand if you've never given God all your heart, you've never given God all your life? Today, do that. Pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, you can put it right back down. And go forward in your relationship with God. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you haven't done this. Maybe you did this as a kid or a Harvest or Billy Graham crusade and you never really followed through with it. Or, or, or you're not sure. Don't leave today without making sure. Let's go forward in your relationship with God. Who should raise your hand? If you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God, doing your own thing instead of God, saying, floating around in your relationship. Hey, let's make this the day you go forward in your relationship with God, ensuring your place in heaven forever and never leaving hell behind. Oftentimes I hear about people say, well, I, I, I'm not sure whether I believe in heaven or hell even exists. Let me tell you something. Just because you don't see it, just because you don't feel it, doesn't mean it's not real. Hey, you know the, the radio and the microwaves that go through the air every day of our lives to power our phones and our televisions? We know they're there, but we don't see them. Heaven's real enough for God to speak about. It's real enough for Jesus to talk about. It's real enough for you and I to take it serious. Oftentimes in our society we hear people say, well, I have a hard time believing in a God that makes it his business to condemn people to hell. Let me tell you something. Stop being so deceived by the devil. God is not in the business of condemning people to hell. Hell was never designed for you. It was never intended for you. It is not God's will or desire for you to go. But God gave you the free will choice to choose or to not choose. And he did everything in his power by giving Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross for you and I to make the choice ourselves to give him all of our heart, to give him all of our life. The decision is yours and yours alone. You can't make it for the person next to you. It's yours. So if that's you in this place, if you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life, get ready. This is your moment. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If you're not sure, hey, make sure. If you've been living lukewarm, running from God instead of to God, hey, make this the first week of January 2014. The day, the, the week that you go forward in your relationship with God. Whether you're in the front or you're in the back, you're watching online or you're in, around the campus in the, in the cafe or you hear the sound of my voice. Whatever you're doing, this is your moment. Stop what you're doing. Get ready. This is your time. I'm going to count to three. Get ready. Pop your head up. And once I count to three, I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. Here we go. Get ready. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. I see you. One, two, three, four. I see you guys right there. Let me see your hands. You popped your hand up. Let me see them. Four wise people, five wise people back there. I see that hand in the back. Five wise people. How about over here? Six, I see you. Six wise people. Seven, I got you right there. Where are you at today? You want to give them all your heart? You want to give them all your life? Anybody else in this place today? Seven wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Come on, I know God's speaking to you. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. It's God speaking to your heart right now. And if God's speaking to you, don't start out in disobedience. Come on, if that's you, pop your hand up so I can see it. We'll go forward in your relationship. Seven, eight wise people. Anybody else in this place today? You want to give them all your heart. You want to give them all your life. You're saying, man, I wonder if this guy's ever going to shut up. Maybe that's an indication of what you need to do. Anybody else in this place today? Seven, eight wise people. Anybody else? I'm going to close it up right now. Don't miss your opportunity. What else? Come on, where are you at? Well, praise God for seven or eight wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do. For those of you that raised your hand, for those of you that were naughty and didn't, but you know you should have, 
just a moment. We're all going to sing a song together. Elijah's going to play a song on the keyboard. We're all going to stand. Please don't get up and walk out during this time. But if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, here's what. You said you want to give him all your heart. You said you want to give him all your life. Let us help you. You don't get saved. Remember, I said you want to get saved. You say, I want to do this. You get saved by making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. You get saved by professing and believing. We want to help you. We want to pray with you. We want to get some information into your hands and set you in the right direction to fulfill God's plan for your life. Don't do this alone. So if that's you, if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. I want you to get your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. And get in the aisle and come meet me here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. If you brought somebody or you came with somebody, look at them and say, I'll go with you. And let's change destinies together. Come on, let's all stand together. If that's you, whether you're in the front or the back, come on, let's change destinies up here at the altar today. You come, come on. If that's you, you can come. Come on. Listen, today is a new day. Today, you're not going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. It's a good thing. Good decision. Here's what I want to do. See this really cool looking guy right over here in the white coat waving at you? That's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. He's going to take you right over there. Listen, nothing weird goes on. Oh, I promise I am as weird as it gets, and you made it through me, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You're going to just pray a simple prayer, very easy. It's about the heart and what you're saying behind the message. He's going to give you some free literature to help you set you in the right direction. Hey, you're going to walk out of this place. Now what do you do? We want to help you with that direction. And finally, he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. You're called spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet you right before church to buy you a cup of coffee or get you a cup of coffee right down in our cafe. Teach you some things about the Word of God for about 15, 20 minutes or so. And they'll get you strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to the life that you came from, all right? So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.